1964 saw the very first comic book convention, the New York Comic Con. Now, there had been science fiction fantasy uh, conventions since the late 1930s. This is the first one specifically for fans of comic books. And they actually had, as their special guest, Steve Ditko, uh, the uh, uh, guy who did, uh, along with Stan Lee, Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. And he was there doing sketches for people and autographing them, something that has become a staple at uh, Comic-Cons. Also, there was uh, original art donated by Jack Kirby from Marvel and Kurt Swan from DC. Kurt Swan's the guy that did Superman for years and years. Among the many people who attended this thing was a young fan who had uh, already had his name in print on the letters pages of several Marvel comics, I think starting with Fantastic Four. Young guy, teenager, named George R.R. R. Martin. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, and then, also in 1964, Stan Lee was invited to be the guest speaker at Bard University and was paid a $50 honorarium. And he came there and, uh, and spoke, and more students showed up to hear him speak than had showed up when former President Eisenhower came to speak. So... Uh, Marvel was wildly popular on college campuses. Two weeks after he appeared at Bard University, he was appearing at Princeton University. And then he was appearing just about everywhere else, traveling around the country, uh, making uh, uh, appearances as a, as a guest speaker at college campuses. Uh, here is some correspondence that Lee exchanged with the uh, student president of the Princeton chapter of the Mighty Marvel Marching Society, MMMS, which had about 40,000 members around the country. And uh, here, the photograph, the officers of the Princeton chapter of the MMMS visiting the New York offices of Marvel and meeting Stan Lee. Well, 1965, Stan Lee gets interviewed in the Wall Street Journal and shortly afterward in the Village Voice and shortly afterward in the New York Times and shortly afterward practically everywhere else. Things were going so well and Stan was becoming so busy with all these things that in 1965 also, Marvel hired three more writers to be on staff. Now, up to this point, Stan Lee had been writing everything for all 16 of their titles, except occasionally Larry Lieber, his brother, would write uh, on some. And now they're, they're bringing in some more people. So, uh, two of them as, as writers and one as a writer and an editorial assistant to Stan Lee. So we had, uh, let's talk about the editorial assistant they hired first, Steve Skates, um, who was uh, about 22 years old, just out of college. And uh, he had, uh, he'd been an English major and uh, he was a pretty good writer, but wasn't the greatest editor for comic books because comic books requires more than just, you know, good writing. He let several artistic mistakes slip by, and Stan got really upset about that, so he demoted him, and uh, instead made one of the other new writers, Roy Thomas, his editorial assistant. Now, Roy Thomas was from the uh, St. Louis area, and he had been uh, a huge and very visible fan for, uh, uh, well, since the early 60s. We talked about that a little bit, although I misspoke earlier when I said that he had founded the fan magazine Alter Ego. He didn't found it. It was established in 1961, and he had taken over as editor of it in 1964 and was the editor of it for years and years thereafter. So, I mean, he is very closely associated with it. Anyway, 
because uh, both because he had written in so often and because he had been the editor of this uh, this fan magazine that conducted a lot of interviews. A lot of people knew him in the industry, and so he came in. Uh, initially uh, as a writer, then became also editorial assistant. And he had brought in uh, a friend of his, also from the St. Louis area, Denny O'Neill, who had been uh, working as a journalist and uh, writing editorials. So uh, Denny O'Neill also, also comes in. So there's the three of them, and they're there to pick up Stan Lee's slack on the writing. But... He didn't leave a whole lot of slack, um, not enough to warrant three people. So he wound up uh, having Denny O'Neill working on romance comics and uh, Millie the Model and a couple of westerns. Uh, Steve Skates, uh, once he was demoted from editorial assistant, he was a western guy. And Roy Thomas, Roy Thomas had, uh, had an ability, Now all three of these guys were good writers, but Roy Thomas was able to mimic the writing style of Stan Lee really well. Uh, and so he was kind of a seamless fit as Stan started having less involvement and being the regular writer on fewer of the books. So Roy Thomas wound up taking over Doctor Strange and the Avengers. Uh, and then as we have discussed before, uh, a few years after that, when Stan Lee left the comic book part of the business and went out to Hollywood to be in charge of the, uh, the movie and animation part, Roy Thomas became editor-in-chief of Marvel for a relatively short time. We'll get to that later on. Well, Roy Thomas is finding plenty to do at Marvel, and it's going to be very influential. Remember, he's the one that uh, talked Stan Lee into licensing various things, from uh, Fu Manchu to Conan the Barbarian. But Denny O'Neill and Steve Skates weren't really, uh, they weren't really getting that much work, and uh, it wasn't all that satisfying. So within a short time, they left, they both left Marvel and went over to Charlton, Comics to work for Charlton's uh, editor in chief, Dick Giordano. Dick Giordano. Uh, Dick Giordano had been a penciler and inker for for many years, and had kind of worked his way up uh, the editorial ladder. So you know he was a guy who had been in the trenches as an artist, and he was in the process of bringing back some of Charlton's superhero characters from the Golden Age. You may not remember us talking about Charlton superhero characters from the Golden Age. That's because they weren't that significant. And so he's now trying to bring them back and create a few new ones. And Denny O'Neill and Steve Skates go to work on, on that. Skates was also working some at Tower Comics. Um, just a couple of years later, 1967, um, the Charlton superheroes, turns out there was a reason no one liked them the first time. Uh, they didn't do that well. And uh, Dick Giordano was actually hired by DC Comics to come over as an editor in 1968. When he did, he took Denny O'Neill and Steve Skates with him. And they both, in the 1970s, were primarily associated with DC Comics. But they were part of this trio of new writers that uh, Stan Lee brought in in 1965. And really the first expansion of the writer's part of the bullpen in a very long time. Now, also in 1965, Stan Lee had a meeting with John Romita. John Romita, uh, an Italian-American from Brooklyn, had been in the uh, comic business since the late 1940s. He was an artist, penciler and inker, and uh, he had started working for Atlas in 1951 and worked for them for years all through the early and mid-50s uh, working on just about everything that they did. He did a lot of, uh, uh, well, he did the uh, the brief effort where they tried to bring back Captain America, uh, and he also took over as penciler for Prince Waku uh, of the Bantu uh, with his second appearance. And uh, 
and drew the rest of them. But back in 1957, when Martin Goodman made some of those bad business decisions and was therefore really strapped for cash, and then he found that trove of uh, unused stories, remember that, and basically fired everybody except Stan Lee. Um, John Romita uh, lost all of his uh, uh, Atlas work. He was a freelancer. He wasn't on staff. And so then he had gone to D.C., and he worked at D.C. for years afterward, mostly in their romance comics. Uh, But they were starting to cut back on their romance comics by 1965. And so he had been actually transitioning to be a commercial artist. But Stan Lee, hearing about this, asked to meet with him and offered to match what he was being paid by the commercial art company that he had gone to work for if he would come to Marvel. And he would let him work from home if he wanted to. He didn't have to come into the office. Or if he came into the office, he could have whatever office he wanted. He really wanted John Romita. And uh, Romita came and uh, started, uh, well, he took over as penciler for, uh, he worked on Daredevil for a while, a couple of other things. Uh, Most significantly, he replaced Steve Ditko on Amazing Spider-Man after Ditko got mad and, and left after issue 38 because he and Stanley were arguing so much about which direction the stories should go. And uh, Ramita's version of Peter Parker and the other supporting cast really kind of became the template for the look of those characters thereafter. Within a short time after uh, coming back to Marvel, he was the de facto art director. He was was going through double-checking various things, people's covers, uh, and making necessary corrections and suggestions until eventually they made it official uh, and gave him the title of art director, which he held for decades. Now, in the 1980s, the early 80s, his son, John Romita Jr., broke into the business as an artist and became uh, one of the more popular artists uh, working in comics starting in the 1980s. So at that point, Everyone had to start referring to John Romita as John Romita Sr. to tell them apart. 1966 saw a storyline in Fantastic Four that would quickly come to be considered the high water mark of Marvel Comics in the 1960s, if not, in fact, the high water mark for the entire Silver Age. And that was the three part story. The coming of Galactus. Now, Galactus, he's the guy there in the uh, blue and purple, is this huge giant alien who eats planets. Uh, The bald guy is Uatu, the Watcher. Now, the Watchers are an alien race of historians, essentially, whose job it is to observe, observe things that are happening and make a record of them. And Uatu is the watcher for uh, that, that is assigned to Earth. However, he's come to be kind of fond of these humans. And so he breaks the rules of the watchers. They're never supposed to get directly involved. And when he sees that Galactus is coming, goes down to warn the Fantastic Four. Now, it's uh, worth mentioning, if you saw... The, uh, uh, the second Guardians of the Galaxy movie and you didn't know who the Watchers were, Stan Lee's cameo might have confused you. But now, knowing what you know, then you would realize why some people in the, uh, the audience were delighted at this because in this cameo, St- uh, Stan Lee in a, an astronaut outfit is making a report to the Watchers telling him all the things that have happened in all the previous movies that he had cameos in. So, The implication here is that the reason Stan Lee keeps popping up in all the Marvel movies is because he is uh, one of the the Watcher's agents on Earth. Anyway, back to Galactus. So he comes along and he eats planets. Now, he doesn't literally chow down on the planet. Uh, He doesn't like, you know, uh, eat it uh, like... uh, break it into pieces and chew on it and stuff. 
Rather, he has this machine called the Elemental Converter that breaks down the planet and destroys it in a giant explosion, releasing all this energy, which Galactus will then absorb into himself. All right, well, uh, just a, a quick uh, side trip uh, for us here. My collection of superhero hero clicks uh, massed together in all their heroic glory are blissfully unaware of the impending doom of the world they know via the elemental converter wielded by the hands of Galactus, Ravager of Worlds. All right, back to the show. So, Galactus doesn't come alone. With him, or actually ahead of him, comes his herald. His herald is the Silver Surfer. So his job as Galactus' herald was ser uh, search out suitable planets for Galactus to consume. Now, uh, generally speaking, the Silver Surfer, he's kind of a nice guy. He doesn't like to see populations destroyed, so he will, he will direct Galactus toward uninhabited planets whenever possible. But if there are no uh, uninhabited planets close enough uh, by that would suit Galactus' needs, well, you know, somebody's got to go. Now, the Silver Surfer, obviously, since he appears in this story, is also co-created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. But the fact is that uh, Kirby had a lot more hand in the very existence of this character than Stan Lee did. Remember, remember how the comics uh, were done in the Marvel style, at least, as opposed to the style used by DC and most other companies, where the writer writes out a word-for-word -word script that the artist follows. Well, at Marvel, Stan Lee's method, and the reason he was able to write 16 books a month, is he'll quickly give a plot outline to an artist, and then the artist draws it, then he comes back and adds in the, uh, the words, right? Well, there was nothing about a silver surfer in the plot outline. But uh, Kirby thought, you know, somebody as, as extremely powerful uh, as Galactus would probably have a herald to announce his coming. And so um, he draws one in, and he thinks, well, he should be very sleek and aerodynamic looking, soaring through space like someone, you know, um, gliding on the waves on a surfboard. And so that's how he, that's how he draws him, with this sort of... Uh, a high-tech cosmic surfboard and uh, with his skin covered by this st silvery metal alloy. So Stanley was a little surprised when he saw that and he had to figure out, you know, what's this guy supposed to be saying? But, you know, it worked out and I may be mistaken. I think it may have been Stan Lee's idea for the surfer to... Um, Spoiler alert, betray Galactus, because like Uatu, he feels sorry for the humans, and so he helps them. He helps Reed Richards find a way to prevent the, uh, uh, the device of Galactus from, from working and destroying the Earth. Uh, as a result, Galactus is ticked off and he leaves, um, but he traps his herald on Earth. He has this invisible force field, so the Silver Surfer can no longer soar the spaceways. He's um, banished to this backwater planet. Uh, eventually, a few years later, he's able to uh, break through that. But that's why the Silver Surfer is confined to Earth and is uh, now one of Earth's superheroes, one of their very, very, very powerful superheroes. Now, a couple of years after this, the Silver Surfer got his own title, written by Stan Lee. This is 1968. By this time, um, probably half or more of the titles were written by someone other than Stan Lee. But he took this one on because even if the Silver Surfer wasn't his original idea... Um, he became his favorite, one of his favorite characters. He liked sort of the nobility of him, sort of the Shakespearean tragedy of uh, him being confined 
to this place where he doesn't want to be. Uh, and so uh, Stan Lee wrote this, uh, this series and uh, John B. Sema drew it. Unfortunately, everyone was not yet as attached to the Silver Surfer as Stan Lee was, although he was very popular among college students. But the book didn't sell, and it got canceled after a little over a year. Uh, something that uh, actually kind of depressed Stan Lee. Okay, also in 1966, Stan Lee gave an interview to the New York Herald Tribune. Well, Stan Lee gave a gazillion interviews. Right, so why are we going to focus in on this one, which we are, spoiler alert, because the interview is significant in and of itself for uh, sort of the uh, chain reaction of events that it sets off. And it's also very, uh, it very well illustrates the kinds of things that were happening in these interviews that Stanley was giving all the time. Now remember, He's very bombastic. He's very much a showman. By the way, uh, this, is, uh, this is the actual article here. I find it very interesting that whoever did the art, or at least the coloring for the newspaper, uh, when they inserted these figures of the Fantastic Four, for some reason just assumed they were all in short shorts or their underwear, uh, whatever. Anyway, yeah, so uh, be that as it may. Uh, you may be looking at this thinking, well, that's an interesting looking article. I'd like to read it. I have several long excerpts that I'm going to talk about and quote from, but I'm also going to put those excerpts up uh, afterwards, after I've talked about them, for like, you know, three or four seconds each, just so that if you want, you can, uh, you know, you can hit pause and you can read the actual article beyond just the things that... I quote from it to you. All right, well, basically, article opens up. The, uh, the reporter, Nat Friedland, is uh, introducing us to Stan Lee, also mentions Saul Brodsky, production manager, um, and describes, describes Stan Lee. Stan Lee, 43, is a native New Yorker, an ultra Madison Avenue, rangy look-alike, of Rex Harrison. He's got that horsey jaw and humorous eyes, thinning but tasteful gray hair, the brightest colored ivy wardrobe in captivity, and a deep suntan. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how while he is there in the office, Stanley gets a call from the famous Italian director Federico Fellini, just wanting to hang out sometime. Um, he talks about all the uh, the speaking appearances Lee had recently done, including Bard University, uh, and the extreme popularity of the characters in in uh, on college campuses. He brings out that uh, Marvel circulation has tripled in three and a half years. Uh, now has an annual circulation of thirty five million, um, creeping up on long established Superman DC line. Marvel is a comfortable number two now. Uh, no other company can show anything like Marvel's phenomenal sales growth in the 60s. And he talks about various things, uh, various products that are coming out, which we'll actually take a look at some of them in a little bit. Um, talks about the number of fan letters they get. Um, says, before Stanley dreamed up the Marvel Age of Comics in 1961, now, you can see it's only 1966. Stan Lee has been using the phrase the Marvel Age of Comics so much that even the newspapers have picked up on it. Um, talks about how uh, comic books are mostly kind of dumb stuff meant for small kids who quickly outgrow them, uh, but that uh, uh, academic studies are already being made about Marvel's characters, and then he describes the uh, various uh, the various characters from the Fantastic Four and and Spider-Man. Um, but um, as he's as he's doing this, as he's describing Spider-Man, how neurotic uh, 
he is and how unstable the Hulk is, etc. He, uh, he points out here, uh, Lee always provides full backstage credits for these epics. Bombastically written by Stan Lee, brilliantly drawn by Jack Kirby, beautifully inked by Vince Coletta, bashfully lettered by Artie Simic. Um, talks about how uh, the readers uh, ride in to talk about the most uh, mundane parts of the story. Um, talks about how many, uh, how many, again, how many letters are coming in. But here's where it gets here's where it gets uh, significant in the effect that this interview is going to have. Okay, remember I told you that the uh, the officers of the MMMS from Princeton University came to Marvel. Um, this is how the uh, reporter, who I guess was on hand, uh, this is how the reporter described it. Princeton University's Mary Marvel Marching Society sent up a delegation to meet the master the other day. Fabulous Flo Steinberg, the secretarial star of Marvel bullpen bulletin gossip notes, ushered the group into the presence. Here I am, fellas, said Lee. Uh, I guess it's a pretty big disappointment, huh? Uh, and then they talk about the different books and what they like and don't like about it. Um, and part of the things that the, the, the college uh, fans bring up are the uh, uh, personal things, uh, personal life type things going on in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man. And um, Stanley responds, I don't plot Spider-Man anymore. Steve Ditko, the artist, has been doing the stories. I guess I'll leave him alone until sales start to slip. Since Spidey got so popular, Ditko thinks he's the genius of the world. We were arguing so much over plot lines, I told him to start making up his own stories. He won't let anybody else ink his drawings, either. He just drops off the finished pages with notes at the margins, and I fill in the dialogue. I never know what he'll come up with next, but it's interesting to work that way. All right, so, in other words, Steve Ditko is a no-talent jerk who thinks he knows it all. Okay. Uh, then uh, it goes through uh, the procedure of, of doing the, the writing, which I've described before. The fact that he just hired three new writers. Um... Lee arrives at his plots in sort of ESP sessions with the artists. He inserts the dialogue after the picture layout comes in. Here he is in action at his weekly Friday morning summit meeting with Jack King Kirby, a veteran comic book artist, a man who created many of the visions of your childhood and mine. The King is a middle-aged man with baggy eyes, and a baggy Robert Hollish suit. He's sucking a huge green cigar, and if you stood next to him on the subway, you would peg him for the assistant foreman in a girdle factory. Then uh, the, uh, uh, the reporter observes as Lee and Kirby plan out the next issue of Fantastic Four as they're playing the roles, you know, and speaking the lines and even throwing punches into the air as they kind of act out the story and how it's going to take place. Here's the esprit that makes this the Marvel Age of Comics, the reporter says. You can bet Stan Lee hasn't lost the touch that won him three first prizes in the Herald Tribune's Biggest News of the Week teen contest back at old DeWitt Clinton High School. So in other words, according to the reporter, and this is how it was coming across in, in all the reports, Stan Lee created all this stuff, and he constructed this universe. It was all completely his doing. Um, Stan Lee himself steps in and says Steve Ditko is a, basically a, an arrogant jerk and uh, no talent hack who's going to tank the sales of the book. Um, Kirby, well, look how he describes Stanley. He compares him to a movie star, 
Uh, Rex Harrison, if you don't know him, he was uh, he played the lead in My Fair Lady, which uh, right around that time was racking up all kinds of awards. So he compares him to a movie star and then talks about how frumpy and crumpled and grumpy Jack Kirby is. If you saw him on the street, you'd never guess uh, what he did for a living. You would peg him for the assistant foreman in a girdle factory, chomping on his green cigar. Um, well, suffice it to say, the king was not amused with how he was portrayed, nor with how the process was portrayed. Guess who else wasn't amused? Steve Ditko. Steve Ditko was totally, completely unamused uh, to the extent that he wound up quitting soon after this. And that's when John Romita took over. And also, Bill Everett and Wally Wood were kind of ticked off too, even though they didn't get mentioned by name, perhaps because they didn't get mentioned by name. Um... But, uh, you know, both of these guys were the writers, uh, and Wallywood writer and, and artist, who had worked on Daredevil and other stuff. Bill Everett had been around since, the, since Marvel Comics number one, and they're totally shut out. And even if they had been mentioned, uh, the, the kind of general feeling is they would have been mentioned like Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, kind of as lackeys and assistants, rather than co-creators. Now, was Stan Lee getting a little full of himself and letting all this attention go to his head undeniably. Now, it is true that frequently, even at that time, if you look closely at the wording, he, he, uses, he talks about what we did and what we're going to do, usually not what I did and what I'm going to do. But so far as giving full credit to his co-creators, he really didn't do that until later on when kind of pressed about it. And that left, uh, well, that left a bitter taste in the mouths of Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby in particular. Remember, Jack Kirby was a star at Marvel Comics when it was timely, co-creator of Captain America, one of the most popular characters around, when Stan Lee was 17 years old and refilling his ink pots for him. And so it's kind of like, uh, well, kind of, kind of insulting, he felt, the way that uh, he was both described and the way that his contributions were described. And that, you know, that came out in various ways uh, from Kirby and from others. Now, you'll notice... I haven't talked too much about Joe Simon lately. Earlier, whenever I mentioned Jack Kirby, I mentioned Joe Simon along with him, like they were, you know, like they were Abbott and Costello or Laurel and Hardy. Simon and Kirby with uh, Captain America, with uh, Boys Ranch, Boy Commandos. Uh, Joe Simon had, uh, he had worked some for, uh, uh, for Atlas Comics in the 50s as well. But in 1960, he took a full-time job as editor of a new magazine called Sick, which was yet another imitator of Mad Magazine. Not quite as successful as Cracked, but more successful than many of the others, which quickly fell by the wayside. This one lasted for 20 years. But throughout uh, the entire 1960s, this is what Joe Simon was up to. And one of the, uh, one of the parodies that appeared in the November 1966 issue, poked fun at Stan Lee. The article was called, or the parody was called, The New Age of Comics, and it was written by Joe Simon. The art was by Angelo Torres. Hopefully that name sounds vaguely familiar. He's the guy the artist from EC Comics who did that story with the guy that had the eyeball on his back between his shoulder blades that, uh, that got pulled so that uh, and, and Judgment Day was run in its place. Anyway, um, the uh, uh, description of, uh, of the, uh, the story here is talking about how silly all these new superheroes are. 
uh, quote, you won't find a human being anywhere in these books, and if you ever met the guys who turned it out, you'd run into the same trouble. Uh, and so uh, uh, here in, in this article, you, it really highlights the silliness of, of the characters. Uh, starts off with uh, the, uh, the editor, and you can clearly see who the editor is, uh, say to his artist, you call yourself an artist, Dripco? You should be drawing relief checks. Well, that's Ditko, right? Steve Ditko. Uh, and then as he leaves, he says, uh, all right, do the whole book over and have it on my desk in an hour. We've got 20 other books to get out today. And don't forget to sign my name to it. Well, that was Joe Simon. What about his old partner, um, Jack Kirby? Well, we're going to talk more about this later, but Jack Kirby quits in 1970 and goes to D.C. Um, almost exactly 30 years after the first time he quit Marvel and went to D.C. Anyway, uh, while he's at, D at D.C., he does several new books, new characters, the fourth world thing that we kind of touched on briefly before. Now, one of the books is called Mr. Miracle, about Scott Free, an escape artist. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, anyway, one of the issues, he's got this minor villain who is a, uh, a, a preening, arrogant, know-it-all, ostentatious con artist named Funky Flashman, who's, uh, who has a, a, a very, very receded hairline, but he puts on his toupee and his beard, and then says, uh, fascinating image is the thing, House Roy, why I look almost holy. Clearly, clearly a takeoff on Stan Lee, and then his assistant, his, basically his butler, is named House Roy, uh, that's supposed to be Roy Thomas, and that's a play on houseboy, right, which is your, you know, a personal servant. So, little bit of, uh, little bit of the uh, the feelings of both Simon and Kirby coming out in their uh, uh, in their portrayals of Stan Lee. 